I've been playing open world games ever since I was a child. I still play them, I still love them. But it's a genre that has been bombarded with the accusation of unoriginality, of stagnant design. That every one of them feels the same, that they rarely change things up, that they don't innovate. For a lot of the ones that I've played, I cannot deny these criticisms entirely. Yes, there is a specific structure that is hammered into the core of a lot of open world games. Yet I don't ever tire of them completely, as I know many others do. There is something about them that keeps me coming back to this style of game, and I keep wondering what it is. Is it the wide range of spectacular sights? Is it the exploration at a pace dictated by your own leisure? Is it just the comfort of doing predictable, repetitive, yet enjoyable tasks? Or is it the particular sense of ambience unique to this style of game? Of course, in all of these thoughts, I'm implying that all open world games are of the same style, and that it's a very strict category which, as I will try to argue, is not really true. The lines between linear, hub-based and open world, they blur, that's just how it is. But all of the games that are labeled with the word open world here still share at least some similarities with each other that manage to hook me. So, join me as I try to dig deeper into why I love open world games and why you might too. The first open world game that I've played, or at least the one I vividly remember as such, was Assassin's Creed 2 back in 2011. What a surreal experience to, to climb and jump and side jack through Renaissance Florence and Venice while dressed as a badass and listening to the iconic soundtrack by Jasper Kidd. Something about the combination of the parkour, level design, convincing historical setting and the realistic yet slightly dreamy art style with, you guessed it, the music that accompanies it all. It instantly clicked and will always stay with me. Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, which I played shortly after, had a similar effect. Another earlier experience I had was Far Cry 3, which I played at an uncle's house when I wasn't really allowed to play it because I was too young. And that sense of prohibition, of course, greatly enhanced the experience, <laughs> to my parents' dismay. Far Cry 3 also created a distinct atmosphere with its world. The hostile nature of the Rook Islands oppresses you at first, until you yourself become the predator. I always loved that. There is something to be said on the effect of novelty, especially when we are talking about a genre that has caused so much fatigue among the gaming community. A game that feels like a truly new and perhaps an eye-opening experience something you've never played before is likely to engage, or at the very least intrigue you. If you play the tenth game in a row that you perceive as essentially the same as the first one, the probability of fatigue is obviously high. Even higher when it hasn't been long since the last one. This is obvious, but it needs to be said. My point? Novelty has without a doubt played a role in my love for the early Assassin's Creed games. I had simply not played anything like it before. It might generally be why certain people see the peaks of this style of game in its early days. It would, however, be reductive to praise Assassin's Creed 2's brilliance with blind hands, to imply that it is only good if you haven't played another comparable game before. Great open world games, like any game, stand the test of time and saturation. Games like the Ezio Trilogy and Far Cry 3 hold up today, even long after the novelty of their game design has worn off. Traversal is a crucial element to a good open world. After all, if it's not fun to move around a large space, why would you want to do it? Open world games allow for a large amount of freedom in movement because, well, you can go anywhere at any time, outside of story missions at least. With the right movement system, a world can become a playground. The old Assassin's Creed games exemplify this. They give you so many tools to move around the world, carve your path over and through its roofs and ledges, but it's easy to spend just an hour roaming around the world doing that. Another example for this is Insomniac's Spider-Man, which doesn't give you quite as much freedom or flexibility as, say, Assassin's Creed Revelations. And yet, the feeling of swinging around New York never gets boring. I've definitely spent hours doing just that, picking up collectibles and solving crimes along the way. If the swinging sucked, I wouldn't have done that. The same goes for Batman Arkham Knight, which I might argue is even more fun. So, when a movement system is good, it might push you to engage more with side content. 
but good traversal doesn't necessarily have to be parkour or a range of superhero abilities. Driving a car, steering a ship or riding on horseback can be equally fun. Driving is more exciting than riding a horse for the obvious sense of speed it gives you. Yet riding on horseback can feel soothing when the animations and sound design are just right. Case in point, Ghost of Tsushima. Of course it's nowhere near as mechanically deep as Spider-Man or Assassin's Creed 2, but it still feels satisfying because all of those other things work so well. The same goes for steering a ship like you do in Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag. It's not deep, but the animation, sound design and visuals in general and just the feeling of being on the open seas, it does a lot of heavy lifting. An important point to make here is that, of course, good traversal is not just dependent on the mechanics and controls, but also the world design. And if you're driving cars through a city, then NPC AI as well. But to see how crucial the relationship between mechanics and world design is, you only need to look at Assassin's Creed again. Without all those dense streets, all the ledges and bars, clearly visible objects you can climb, you basically would not have any parkour at all. The mechanics need to fit the world design, and vice versa. I'm going to get some dislikes for this, but I think that The Witcher 3 is a fitting negative example here. In many places, the object density is very high, but the mechanics are not smooth enough to deal with them. Getting stuck on foot, on horseback or on boat is a very common occurrence. If the object density was lower, this wouldn't have been as big of a problem. Or well, in an ideal world, if the controls were also more responsive. I booted up Ghost of Tsushima again after spending a long time playing The Witcher and I was shocked just how much smoother that felt, thanks not just to mechanics but also world design that actually fits them. It needs to feel alive. That's a common criteria for what makes a good open world, I think. That you have to be able to suspend your disbelief enough to accept the world as a possible reality. In more tangible words, that often means towns bustling with NPCs who go about their activities and strike up audible conversations, animals that roam around, a day and night cycle, a richness of detail in the environment, a world that reacts to your presence. This understanding is modeled after a type of open world that comes with inhabited cities surrounded by stretches of nature where you might occasionally bump into an NPC, more often enemies and probably a lot of animals. Often here the conversation though lands on the NPCs. So where does say Elden Ring fit in? I consider it to have one of the most palpable, most alive open worlds that I have gotten lost in. It obviously doesn't fit into set criteria. On paper it is dead and buried. You will not come across any towns full of people that go about their day. The only friendly ones you'll meet in the landscapes of the lands between are alone, desolate. Most of the world is broken, shattered if you will. That goes not just for all of its places, but its inhabitants too. It wouldn't make sense to see busy towns full of people like you would in Horizon Forbidden West or The Witcher 3. In short, the law demands the world's death. The ironic part? Elden Ring's life rests exactly in its decay. The most common criteria for what makes an open world feel alive, NPCs, is arguably the least important part of Elden Ring's allure. Don't misunderstand me, these lone people that you meet absolutely enrich the game's lore, but they do not lie at the core of the game's open world experience. At least not nearly as much as in Horizon or Witcher. So Elden Ring is the perfect example to demonstrate that a believable, immersive world can be many different things and does not need to be restricted to an archetype. The same can be said for Shadow of the Colossus, which is essentially completely dead, much more so than Elden Ring, but it's a deliberate choice to create an eerie atmosphere and it nails that. Empty worlds can work wonders if done right. Death Stranding, Subnautica and Minecraft are all masters of it. These games are still detailed, deliberate and make great use of sound design. It's not the kind of emptiness you find in some games that simply makes a world feel unfinished. I want to return to my list of common criteria for believable open worlds. Roaming animals or people, moving foliage and water, fleshed out sound design, a weather system and a day and night cycle are found in many notable games in this genre, even in a game like Elden Ring. And my conclusion is that it's something deeply human to expect these things from any world. 
Okay, maybe they are not all necessary to make an open world believable, but if an open world game lacks all of them, I think it's definitely much harder to feel immersed. But apart from moving animals, people and foliage and water, what do we mean when we talk about a world that reacts to our presence? This could mean anything from a police system that attracts officers to you when you shoot people in GTA 5 or Watch Dogs 2, civilians stating how weird you are for climbing buildings in Assassin's Creed 2, or simply trash talking random people in Red Dead Redemption 2. I like you, mister. You have a kind face. The kind I like to punch. It can mean something peripheral or something more directly gameplay related, like throwing a Molotov cocktail into a forest that causes it to start burning. You do something as a player and the world's AI or physics react. The essence of this seems to be again a correlation to our own world. When you do something, it has a consequence. As a rule of thumb, you could argue that a game that offers as many of these action-reaction systems as possible will be the most realistic. The most groundbreaking examples of this are Red Dead Redemption 2 and Kingdom Come Deliverance. I've only played the former, but these games have the most impressive and dynamic open world systems that I have ever seen. The fact that you can have a full conversation with any NPC in RDR2 is something I've never seen before in any other game. However, I don't really want to dwell too much on this idea of realism. Yes, the aspect of action-reaction is immense in these games, but we are definitely capable of suspending our disbelief enough if even just half of the things that are possible in these games are also possible in another game. For me, the most important part of an open world are neither the NPCs nor how much it reacts to my particular gameplay actions. These things are vital, but what fascinates me is something else. Ambience. Red leaves rustling in the wind, floating to the ground, sunlight breaking through the thicket, a wind rushing through the forest, subtle melodies and soundscapes playing in the background. Ghost of Tsushima is one of my favorite open world games. Its ambience plays a large role in that. By ambience in open world games I mean the feeling of traversing a part of the world while its very elements slightly sway in the wind, while a piece of music softly plays and you feel compelled to move more slowly to just take it all in. It can be a beautiful vista you come across, it can be as simple as a small forest that may be empty of humans but bursting with different forms of life. I love when a game makes me stop whatever it is I'm doing and invites me to enter a meditative state, take a mental step back and just appreciate the beauty of the world that someone has designed. Escapism at its peak, yes. Quite a number of games have evoked this impulse in me. The ones that stick in my mind the most, however, are Ghost of Tsushima and Elden Ring, where this happened most frequently. I'm sure you're tired of hearing me mention Elden Ring by now, so let's switch gears. This feeling of ambience isn't unique to open world games. There are many games that do not fall into the structure, but can also create it. The unique part for open worlds is that it's often optional. You can easily miss it. Often you stumble upon these things by chance and finding or experiencing something beautiful that you could very well have missed feels special. This is essential for an open world game to achieve from my perspective. Speaking of essentiality, it's time to dive into all the regurgitated structures of the genre that has led to so much fatigue. Exploration in open world games can be incredibly rewarding for the above mentioned factor of missable experiences, finding something by just stepping off the road and going where your eyes lead you. I'm sure you know where this is headed, but it's something that I need to bring up. Map markers, question marks, exclamation marks littering the map and completely overwhelming you with things to do. That in itself can be a problem. It can be even worse. How? When all of those markers lead you to content that is just cheap, copy and pasted with zero effort put into it. Unfortunately, this happens all too often. And oh, does it get old fast. However, I don't want to go into the direction you'd expect and say, stop using map markers, they're terrible. No. I believe that's the wrong way to look at it. Using map markers sparingly can have a great effect, but for most games it's the wrong point to criticize. The content itself matters. 
If a game with no guides on where to find content invites you to explore, but only has redundant things to discover, it's going to be shit either way. I played Horizon Forbidden West earlier this year, and I think that's a perfect reference point here. It's a game that on paper falls into all of the trappings of the commonly despised Ubisoft formula. Though unlike plenty of games of that style, almost all of the things you can find or experience off the main path are designed with care. Every single side quest has a believable story, is fully voiced and motion captured. Every open world activity offers variety, even in repeated structures. Barely anything is repeated exactly the same way twice. Before jumping directly to the simple conclusion lying in reach that Horizon 2 proves that only the actual content matters and that map markers are amazing, I need to give some more nuance actually. The map in the game is completely fogged before you climb the tall necks or actually go to the fogged areas, so you are not bombarded right away with a thousand damn question marks. Often, when you play in explorer mode that is, these markers only appear once you've been close to them and if you look at the map afterwards, you can see what you've missed. Horizon also ensures that you feel compelled to go off the main path because something in the actual world catches your interest, rather than the map. So my conclusion is that simply using or not using map markers is not what matters. It's about how and when they are uncovered, if the content can also be found in an organic way, and of course how worthwhile that actual content is. I've talked plenty about games that get things right so far. Time to look at the other side. The Assassin's Creed series, despite how much I love a lot of its games, and despite all the things it gets right, it also has a number of issues. One of my least favorite entries, Syndicate, is a good example here. The game is basically structured around you liberating the various districts of London by doing certain open world missions. The problem? They are extremely repetitive and grindy, especially the factory liberations, which have basically no variety in visuals or structure or anything interesting. And there's like two dozen of them. The same goes for the kidnapping missions. It all gets old incredibly fast. Assassin's Creed has pioneered the genre in many ways, but even the older games have repetitive content that really just serves to pad out the world. The feathers in AC2 and equivalents in Brotherhood and Revelations, the cockades in Unity and a lot more. Those feathers in cockades could be seen as mini parkour challenges, but they're not exactly stellar content, are they? Assassin's Creed has also struggled with a different problem. Valhalla has quite a bit of variety in its collectibles and activities. The problem there is that there's simply way too much of everything. The good becomes insufferable. As many before me have said, Ubisoft is guilty in general of missing the mark in this regard. For me personally, however, it does not ruin any of these games. They still have plenty of other things going for them that I've mentioned. Similarly, Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War are jam-packed with repeated content and while hardly optimal in its delivery, it's still fun. Then there's the open world of Mafia Definitive Edition, which despite the game being a linear experience, offers the option to explore the world freely. My criticism here doesn't lie in how it uses map markers, instead how it generally fails as an open world game in many aspects. Apart from the police, it's not really reactive at all, there's almost nothing to do and the city feels dead up close and it's definitely not a logical design choice like it was in Shadow of the Colossus. It's clearly just there so you can drive around the city freely, nothing more, and I find that disappointing to be honest. If you're going to have an extra open world game mode, you better make it worthwhile. There are some games that aren't what I would usually associate with the term open world, for different reasons. Is Resident Evil Village an open world game? Are the Yakuza like a dragon games? Is Metro Exodus one? Death Stranding? They don't quite fit into the mold that Ubisoft has shaped and that has cemented itself as the thing we call open world games. Either the lines blur with a more linear style of game, as with Resident Evil or Metro Exodus, or in the case of Yakuza, you can go anywhere at almost any time, but it trades the vast of a typical open world for a small but dense nightlife district. Death Stranding on the other hand does have vast landscapes, but there are loading screens between its three areas. Then there are Uncharted 4, The Lost Legacy and The Last of Us Part 2, that all have exactly one open area to explore, respectively. Which shows that games with open world sections are also not always exclusively built like that. 
And I am sure that there are a number of other games I haven't mentioned here that also blur these lines. They show that the term open world game can be stretched, but it isn't, and shouldn't be, one specific style of game. There is, however, one thing a lot of them share. That sense of ambience and atmosphere. To my mind, the most important thing. I love open world games. They've offered me some of the best gaming experiences I've had. How they can create a tight atmosphere and evoke all kinds of emotion through exploration. How they pique your curiosity through a little smoke pillar rising up from beyond that hill. How they can bring you into that unique and missable meditative state with their ambience. Maybe they transport you to a world that bursts with life. Maybe they transport you to a world of loneliness and death. For all the backlash the genre gets for its repetition, there is still plenty of variety. Now, to close this off, I want to mention a few other open world games that I've enjoyed, but that haven't found their way into the rest of this video. Far Cry Primal and New Dawn, Borderlands 2, Immortals Phoenix Rising, Riders Republic, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, Gold Simulator, Mafia 2, and a few more. If I were to make another video on this topic, I'd surely dwell more on Minecraft and Subnautica than I have here. And here are some more open world games that I still plan on playing. Nier Automata, Days Gone, Cyberpunk 2077, Outer Wilds, Jedi Survivor, Tales of Arise and The Pathless. <laughs> As with everything else, I might only ever get around to a fraction of these. Games like these tend to be quite the time investment. Now I'm curious to hear from you. Do you like open world games? If so, which ones are your favorites and which have been the most formative for you? If not, what is it that puts you off? I hope to read some interesting comments, if this video even reaches anyone. But to anyone that it did, I thank you for watching and until next time.